morning on this rainy, rainy <clears throat> fall day, October 22nd, maybe. I think we're past the fall color tour, and so my days are going to get a lot easier now, grading in from dealing with hundreds and hundreds of um, happy visitors to more or less fall cleanup and then going into my, my sleeping season of bows in the winter, so that's good. I, I tend to, and I know, I look back and I've gotten, by my standards, an incredible number of videos and a lot of times they're repetitive, but sometimes it takes repetitiveness to like spark some inspiration of thought and it's like, wow, okay. And even I do that. I'll start off doing a video and it's like, blam, in the midst of it, I'll get a thought and that's good as far as bows go because it's a fascinating field. And this one is going to be about white cedar bows, Thusia occidentalis. It's also going to grade into a few other things. And one may ask, why am I fascinated by a wood such as white cedar when there is, let's just say, two different bow woods, you and Osage Orange? You know, obviously, if you're just comparing sheer numbers, as far as like the crushing strength and the um, tensile strength and elasticity, white cedar does not come close to rating as high on these scales as Osage or, or you. But the thing is, if you work with woods that aren't superior and is forgiving, I truly believe that you're going to become a better bow maker in the long run. I could make and I'm just going to hold this up, you shall see it again. I could make a 40 pound, this is a 40 pound white cedar bow that sent you back with a very thin layer. I could certainly make a 40 pound Osage orange bow, a self bow, or send you back, let's say. I could produce this 40 pound bow, 50 something inches long, out of Osage. And I could have a badly tailored bow, I could have a hingy bow, I could have basically a full run over the production of this bow and not worry that it'll be a good bow. Whereas with white cedar, you have to approach it more carefully, more thoughtfully, be more in tune with the, the, the characteristics of the wood. So I believe that producing a 40 pound white cedar bow, and I'm just going to relate this in my viewpoint, my worldview, is a superior bow making experience experience than making a 40 pound Osage bow simply because it's more challenging. Now white cedar can get confused with western red cedar which is also a thuja. It can get confused with Juniperus virginianus with or virginiana which is a eastern red cedar which is a related but a totally different tree. The, the eastern red cedar is what you would buy um, for staves for making, say, a west coast style paddle bow, or some people make English style long bows. It's more of a bow wood than white cedar. I'm going to jump off this train for a bit and talk about a little bit of history. I read somewhere, this was an account of bow woods that the Mandans of North Dakota used, and this was this was written uh, in the time of Lewis and Clark when they were in the upper portion of the Missouri River and they, they, they were helped by the Mandan tribe. And people were trying to record what kind of woods that the Mandan used for bow woods. And one was white cedar. Jumping to modern times, there was a bow maker that was saying, well, it probably wasn't white cedar because you can't make bows out of white cedar. It was probably yellow cedar. Now that was probably taken, taken as truth by the people that felt this person knew what he was talking about. And, and so the conclusion was that you cannot make a white cedar bow, and it was probably yellow cedar. Well, obviously you can make white cedar bows. I've got one that's strong and has been shot about 100 times here. It's light, it's 40 pounds, but it's an extremely fast white cedar bow. The other thing that I take exception with is it couldn't have been yellow cedar. 
Cupressus nutcatensis, um, also known as yellow cypress and nutca cypress. Grows nowhere near North Dakota, so that's, that can't be true. It's a west coast, actually a Pacific coastal tree that grows British Columbia, Washington, kind of in that area, just right along the coastline. So yellow cedar couldn't be used as a bow by the Mandans unless they've already walked to the west coast and came back, which, you know, obviously they didn't because they weren't able to say, okay, um, <clears throat> Senor Lewis and Senor Clark, you just go that way because there's the, the Pacific Ocean there. They weren't aware of it, and so that kind of invalidates that whole idea that they were using materials from the Pacific Northwest. White cedar, Thuja occidentalis, or I've made bows out of western red cedar, Thuja, oh gosh, it begins with a P. But it's basically the same kind of wood. You go to a lumber yard, you go to a big box store, you buy cedar for construction. That would typically be western red cedar, which is, the wood is extremely similar to our northern or eastern white cedar, which is the same tree. And that's what two of these bows are made out of. Now, as far as producing a white cedar bow, and again, you have to pay particular attention to the form, the design, the, the projected draw weight, draw length. It's more critical than with uh, Osage Orange. I believe that there are, are two really good, actually three forms of white cedar bows that would that would pay off, that would that would feed your family if you were to hunt with them. Two of these forms are very much related. The first form, simple D bow, just shaped like the letter D. And this obviously is a workable bow. You can drop a deer-sized animal with a 40-pound bow. And if I was to compare arrow cast between this white cedar 40-pound bow, thin layer, thin protective layer of sinew on it, to the arrow cast of a 40-pound almost anything other bow, same amount of reflex, same length, I would stack this one up against any of those other bows because the limbs are almost weightless. White cedar is extremely light, low density, so you have a fast response time, less mass to accelerate, more energy that can go straight to the arrow instead of making these limbs move. Uh, viable weapon. Did natives in North America use bows that were 40 pounds? Sure. Yes. And so... Right there, I can prove that, you know, white cedar was used for bows. Why not? It grows almost everywhere. Red cedar in the west, western red cedar, to eastern and northern white cedar, which are the same trees, the thujas, they grow from coast to coast, and they grow north, and they grow pretty far south. And so this was around. It's soft. It's easy to work. It is a bow wood. Maybe not as cherished as Osage or Hickory or the other ones, but this is a bowhead. Now, I have a lesson in tillering in this. In the beginning, before I, I reduced the tips, didn't change the draw weight because when I retillered it to get more bent in the outer portions, I increased my draw length, which gets me right back to the same draw weight. Before I did that, before I fine-tuned it, before I started getting the bend more out here and more distributed, I did develop very, very fine chrysals early in this bow's life, which I didn't mess with. I didn't sand them off because I didn't like the looks of them. If I sanded those chrysals to remove them, I would be removing good wood too, which would cause these to, to further aggravate the situation. So I did not mess with the chrysals. I look at them, I say hi Chrysals, and I just let them go on their merry way because I am not going to take any wood from that area. Typically when you get the, the compression issues, the Chrysals, I don't know how to spell it so I'm not going to have it in my description, they're going to take place between the areas that I am outlining with my thumb, midlands, because 
generally when people are making small D bows, they have too much bend in the handle and in the inner portion, and they don't go out. If you look at a lot of native bows, Comanche bows, short on back bows, you'll notice that when they're unstrung, they have a little deflex. I'm not sure, altogether sure, that they did that intentionally. I believe that's a sign of string follow, which is good. You can judge the tailoring of a bow, unstring it, and if you analyze your string follow, you'll see where the bow is overstressed. In the, in the, um, the scheme of Comanche bows, that's not a bad thing. It's bad to have string follow here. It's not so bad to have it out here. This is a pretty good sign. You're getting a little on the whippy side, maybe more bend. I'm not going to say too much bend. I'm going to say more bend out here. But in the scheme of short native bows, you'll notice they are getting on the whippy side. Not a derogatory term, a good functional term. And I would imagine, not that I did it with this bow because it's a nice circular tailored bow, if it was on the whippiest side, getting more bend as I go out toward the tips, I probably wouldn't get the compression issues because I'm winding up getting thinner limbs here and so I can get a better bend radius and blah, 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 it's a good thing. And, and so that reinforces my notion that with a, a shortish white cedar bow, which not typically bow would, if it was a native bow, they would have had a lot of bend out here, so this wouldn't be an issue in here as far as the chrysals. Okay, the bow form that this <laughs> is similar to, I said there's three bow forms that are probably good for white cedar. The next one that is a, a, a cousin, a, a brother or sister to this one, would be taking this kind of a, as a Mojave bow wood that's made out of um, ugh, cotton wood. Not a great wood. Um, Poplus niger, I think. Which is also like black poplar, black poplar, which I think is cottonwood. They would deflex the limbs. They were longer because popl <laughs> the poplar family does not make stellar bows, so you have to make them longer than this or else bad things are going to happen. And one way to do it, make them a little stiffer, deflex the tips. And so that would be a good form for white cedar to have a successful white cedar bow. Now you've all seen this many times ad nauseum. Paddle bow, deflexed, no, reflexed, you caught me, I did that on purpose. Following a West Coast style, West Coast native style paddle bow, typically in juniper, or U, Pacific U, if it was unbacked, if it was a self bow in oak or vine maple, whatever, um, it would have the same form, a wet weather bow. I do not really, is my confidence level 100% with this one, having a, a reflexed white cedar bow that follows the scheme of a U or juniper bow? Eh, not so much. Uh, because the reflexing, and this has more sinew than that first depot, the reflexing and the added sinew is going to stress the white cedar more. Now it might balance off, you can see, the difference in width. So I've got more wood along here, along the width, to, to withstand compression. This may or may not work. I'll see. It's still drying. I, I have put it on the tiller and tree. I have braced it and pulled it back a little bit and there is absolutely no sign of Chrysling or compression issues. But I would rate in our journey here today, this one or the slightly deflex limb Debo, probably higher on the scale of what you should attempt with a white cedar bow. This, I am going to, all goes to plan, I'm going to mold the belly of this, um, infusing, say, a pine resin, or I, I have copal resin laying around. I might try that because it's a pretty hard resin. There's a fellow, Ryan, hey Ryan, was talking about mango resin. He lives in the Philippines and said that it, in his estimation, his experience, it's less brittle than pine resin. I'm not aware that mangoes live in North America. I'll have to do some research, probably, probably 
that maybe Central America or South America perhaps, but that's a viable thing. I don't know, it's a good experiment. Now as far as white cedar bows in the construction, you're not going to hear this too much, maybe nowhere, because it goes opposite of the typical mindset of bow making, is I believe that they should be made, if they're sinew backed, don't worry about tension, don't worry about following one growth ring on the back. That's a non-issue because the, the sinew will take up the tension. Forget that. This bow, if I look at the grain pattern, it's a typical bow where I have a growth ring and then a growth ring step and then, well, that's just, there's just two. Growth ring step, growth ring step. I believe that this is the way to do it. That when you're making a white cedar bow, and you're attempting, and it could apply to other ones, you're attempting to maximize the draw weight and then send you back, you should pay more attention to the belly than you should the back. And what does that mean? That means that work this thing down so you either have no jumps in the growth ring or you just have parallel. Because you want to, you're concerned with maintaining the integrity of the belly more than the back because the sinew works. So you should work it backwards. Work the bow according to the belly, not doing what I did. There are major skips in the growth rings here, which are going to challenge its ability to withstand compression. And that was dumb on my part. That, I did not think. This was originally going to be an unbacked bow. And so I was very careful on this, maintaining growth ring integrity on the back. And then I send you back it, and I'm looking at the belly, and it's like, I was stupid because I have too many skips, jumps in the growth rings on the belly. I should have worked it according to the belly, and then tillered it. I tiller before, not to full draw length, of course. I tiller before I send you back. I should have tillered it and shaped it on the back, following the belly and not the other way around. That would give me the advantage. You need every advantage with white cedar. Now, I've talked in the past about um, response wood or, or wood that responds in its growth to pressures such as gravity or wind. This was taken from a tree trunk. This was taken from a tree trunk. The wood in this white cedar bow, in the wood in this white cedar bow, is not as dense. It is not as fine growth ring as if I took it from a branch. The branches of this white cedar will be better bow wood than the trunk wood. So if I sat down and said, this is the only bow I'm going to make, so it darn well better work. This is the only sinew I have access to, so it darn well better work. I would have carved this or scraped that or, pardon me, you don't really carve bows, at least the finishing point, I would have made this from a tree branch of cedar and my possibilities of having a very successful bow would have been increased to the moon. I would have increased the possibilities of this becoming a, a great bow if I was cognizant of the growth ring patterns on the belly because I know that the sinew is going to take up the tension. All in all, this is a good experiment because I messed up on the belly and it was from trunk wood. So if this produces a good 40 pound plus bow, I'm actually shooting for like 35 to 38, but why not? If this produces a good 40 pound plus bow, I can say with confidence that white cedar, Thuja occidentalis or Western red, Thuja begins with a P, let's just say P period, is a bow wood that could have been used by the Mandans. They had access to buffalo. And so most likely they were also sinew backing bows. Like something I could look up, but sitting here on my little step, I can say that they most likely sinew back bows. So we talked about two forms. The best forms for a white cedar, a low quality, sorry bows, a bow wood kind of bow. A D bow, D flexed limb, D tip D bow. And this, maybe not so much, but maybe because it's really wide. It's two and a half inches wide there. So maybe, we'll see. The next one, 
I've harped on this a great deal, and this is more about function than it is style. You look at them and you say, that's a BA, family-friendly video here, that's a BA style, but I believe it's function. Let's take that tree branch from cedar. And have you ever seen a straight tree branch? It has a bend. Now picture that this handle doesn't reflex. It's just, there's the bend. You shape your bow. It looks like a D-bow that's already strung. You steam the center. You bend the handle back. You remove all that built-in pre-string follow, which isn't string follow because the branch is already curved. And suddenly, you have a branch-made gullwing bow. No string follow. If I was to do this, the string would be up here. Sinew back. This would be a good form. I haven't done one in the white cedar, but I think I know enough so far about gull wings and in these bows to say that this would be one of the prime forms for a white cedar bow. Firstly, because you're taking that curved branch and with its dense wood, making a bow out of it. Secondly, simple to steam. You don't even need to have a stove or a turkey turkey roaster. You can steam with hot rocks and um, wet grass and stuff and just put the bow down there and just let that steam handle it. It gets hot and then bend it back. And trust me, if the natives were able, natives in North America were able to take cedar and make birch bark canoes or wigwas jimans in their language in the in the Shinabe manner of speaking and shape that wood, they can shape bows from cedar too. And if you're out there making canoes, it can run rapids out of cedar and birch bark. You know those materials are tough and resilient, and so bows need to be resilient. The, the, the second part of this is theoretical on my part because I've been trying to wrap my mind around this. Think about this. I, I suppose I could figure it out with a D-bow and then a gull wing and compare and figure things out and measure and factorize, but just intuitively, I believe that taking a bow, rounding the limbs will result in a different, say, bend radius, the amount of actual bending in the limbs, to draw length ratio. What does that mean? Hard for me to vocalize. But think about this. I have a D bow. This really is a great little bow. It's been shot over a hundred times because when there's nobody here, this is what I'm like dusting pine cones with in the yard. I believe, may or may not be true, that when you bend these limbs back, you are allowing this bow to have more draw length relative to the amount of bending that's taking place. Ah, so let's take, keep pulling this back, a D ball, and let's say, and I'm going to make up a scale here of bend radius, amount of bending here. Let's say I draw this to 24 inches, and let's say these are the same length, then using this mysterious made up scale, the bend, amount of bend in here is 5. What did that say? Drawing 24 inches. Now, you have to pretend that this is the same length bow. Drawing it to 24 inches, my theory is that the actual amount of bending in the limbs, the forces working on this, will be a 4. Does that make sense? That you take that D-bow, you draw it to 24 inches, <clears throat> and the bend number in that D-bow will be a five. You take this bow, and let's say it's the same length, you draw it to 24 inches, brace heights all being equal, the bend number on these limbs will be four, just because of the geometry of it. I might be full of it, but from what I've seen, because I've made so many gull wing bows, um, I don't know how many, 50 to 100 maybe, maybe more, made bunches of these things, but what I've seen is, with unbacked, unbacked bows, unbacked gullwing board bows. 
What I've seen is I can take an unbacked D ball, just a flat ball, and then I can take a heavier, thicker, a more stressed red oak, board ball, flat ball, and gull wing it. That thing functions better. It seems to hold together better because I have shaped it. And so this is that mysterious thing. I appreciate that you like sit through my little treatises. I do. And hopefully, you know, you can you can kind of understand where I'm coming from with all this. There are so many bow videos out there, really nice ones. I'm not like putting anyone down whatsoever. I have the greatest respect for somebody that makes bows and then puts out a video. But what I'm trying to do is carry that a bit further. And instead of like, this is how you make a bow and you scrape it down. This is how you carefully tell her, this is how you make this a bow. I'm trying to like get people to think even further into this, why it is a bow. Why does it work? Why do you do this? And with this, I truly believe that in the long run, you're going to be better bow makers. I've led you down some rabbit holes, I know, that don't go anywhere. And I'm referring to one as far as like, excuse me, peeing on your bow, basically, to see if you can crystallize stuff in it to, to malm it, pee malming. You know, that, that could be nothing, but where that led was somebody, um, give me a break, who was actually mulmed before with pine resin that basically gave us the recipe. And in fact, a lot of new ideas or ideas that were old that were forgotten that come back, they come from these rabbit holes that may or may not lead anywhere. So that is it. My heart is light because I basically made it through the season. Survived. Survived the 2017 season nicely with a lot of happy visitors. Can't really say. I mean, there was some goofy stuff happening, but no public incidents to report other than like catching a couple that jumped off the platform and ran through the dunes, which on the scale of 1 to 10 is like a point. Zero five, no injuries except the poor guy like cut the tip of his toe on a rock in in the lake. That's it. it. Was a charmed. It was a charm charm season. Heavy traffic between eight and ten thousand people. Places intact. Lots of happy visitors. It worked out well. Now it's recovery time, along with. Throwing some seeds out for the turkeys. I see them looking at me through the window. They have a wonderful day. Thank you for watching. And I appreciate you. You know, and, and please, you know, I feel so funny about people like thinking and, and, and saying of my caliber. It's, I'm just a guy that's lucky enough to have time to do this. So, you know, there should not be any separation as far as like some people are here and some people. Nah, be humble. Bye now.